Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Very welcome to our Brussels conference on the future of health research and innovation after Horizon 2020. My name is Hans Belsma. I am the current president of EULAR, and it is a real pleasure to welcome all of you to Brussels and to this meeting. I would especially welcome the people sitting at the table here because they are for the opening meeting. So that will be uh, Professor Colm O'Moran from the Alliance of Biomedical Research, the Member of Parliament, Mrs. Merja Kilonen, just arrived, very welcome to you. Then we have people from the WHO, Mrs. Lumineta Hayes, and we have people from uh, EULAG, Mr. Neil Betteridge and Dieter Wieck. So it's a real pleasure for me to start this uh, conference. And I would like to, um, if people want to use the hashtag, please use hashtag EULA Brussels 2017. And the meeting will be uh, sent out by Instagram. And we have now the opening session. And I would like to say a few words about the World Arthritis Day, which we had last week, as you know. I will tell you a little bit about the previous conferences that we had in the context of this World Arthritis Day. We started them in 2010. And we used these conferences to bring together the community of people involved in uh, rheumatic and musculoskeletal diseases, people taking care of them, people who take care of them by doing... Um, in the, in the community, but also at the legislation level, at the EU and at the national policy, and many stakeholders present here. And we always try to focus on relevant policy developments. So one of the previous was about the uh, challenges in work capacity, prevention of chronic diseases, chronic diseases and healthcare delivery, reducing access barriers to healthcare, towards a more integrated healthcare in Europe, especially cross-border care and health professionals' mobility. And last year, we discussed reducing the burden of chronic diseases in the workplace. And we thought that it's very timely now, in 2017, to discuss the future of AU health research and innovation. So that's the theme of today. So what are our goals for today? We would like to identify the key challenges in health research and innovation. We would like to discuss with you the future of European health research and innovation policies. And we would like to gather with you to develop some policy recommendations in the field of the next EU research framework program, the transfer of research findings into daily practice, engagement of patients in research and innovation, and also very important, of course, the public-private relationship, partnership. So the structure of today will be an opening session, and there will be a few welcoming words. Then we have two keynote speeches. Then you are allowed to have some relaxation and coffee and to interact with each other. Then we have a plenary session with some lectures. And then the most important part, of course, is listening to yourself, because we would like to get your opinion, your input, and your ideas. And therefore, we have workshops. I come back to that later. At the end, we have some central reporting of those workshops, and then we will have a concluding panel debate and a closing session. So these are the workshops that you have received on your badge. There is a number and a color. And please keep to that number and color, because we have tried to even out a little bit the different workshops to bring in people from the different uh, points of view. So please stick to your number. And we will show that later there are in different rooms the workshops. The first one dealing with, which I just mentioned, the next research framework, challenges in transferring in the second one, engagements of patients, the third one, and, and private-public um, partnership in the last one. So we're very much looking forward to the results of those workshops. As I told you, there's a live streaming of this meeting, so only for the um, public meetings in this room not for the workshops, and I already told you about the Twitter. So it's a pleasure for me to start this day 
Dus een very impressive video, which was made in the context of our campaign, Don't Delay, Connect Today. And I hope it's going to work. My name's Kate Betteridge. I was diagnosed with adult form rheumatoid arthritis back in 1986 when I was 13. The diagnosis came within about eight weeks, which is fairly quick. From a young age, I've always been really interested in words and I wanted to become a journalist. I won a competition to write for um, Wales's national newspaper and I had to go away for a week. And suddenly there's me, 17, having to fend for myself, cope for the first time by myself with my rheumatoid arthritis with a group of people I didn't know in a really unknown setting. They saw me as me, not as a disease, was really important. My hope for the future is that um, doctors certainly become more aware, GPs, family doctors become more aware of some of the symptoms. Early diagnosis and early treatment is essential. The support I got from health professionals really was fantastic and I think helped shaped how I am today. Um, and it is really important not to let rheumatoid arthritis, juvenile arthritis take control. It is part of my life, but it certainly doesn't rule it. Uh, hello, my name's Aaron Chohan, and I'm 11 years old. So I like to do football, raising um, money for charity. And the charity I do is CCAA, which is Children's Chronic Arthritis Association. And the reason I do it is because I've got juvenile arthritis myself. I feel confident that because of the early diagnosis, that some of the later complications are, have, have probably been avoided as a result. Making contact with the healthcare professionals, it has such a, a change, such an, a, an impact. Um, you know, it allows Aaron to fully um, you know, live a day-to-day -day life. And all my doctors have been patient with me and, and they've helped me and, and made me feel like I, I don't even have to be worried about it. I'm Simon Stones, I'm 23, I'm from Manchester in the UK and I've lived with juvenile idiopathic arthritis now for 20 years. So living with arthritis and health conditions for the majority of my life, I think that experience really inspired me to address those issues that I face and many other young people face and all the things that needed to be changed. It has led to me where I am now as a PhD student trying to help children with arthritis and other conditions to better manage those conditions. But GPs only received quite a small amount of training for rheumatic and musculoskeletal diseases, let alone those conditions in children. And I think it's really important for GPs to listen to the young people and to the parents because they are dealing with these symptoms every day. If we get a diagnosis quickly, that child can have such a different life. So this is a very uh, important film, so if people want to use it, they can approach the people from the Eula House to, make, uh, to get a copy of it, to use it for your public awareness activities or others. And we think from the Eula side it's very important to put emphasis on the possibilities that we have to help our patients if we see them early enough and are able to start treatment early enough. So that's why we call it Don't Delay, Connect Today. And after that, it's a real pleasure for me to ask a few people to say a few words about the future of health research and innovation after Horizon 2020. And the first one I would like to introduce is Professor Colm O'Moran. He um, survived the hurricane, Ophelia. He's from Dublin and had quite a difficulty in getting from Dublin to Brussels yesterday. He's the president of the Alliance for Biomedical Research in Europe. And he has held many positions in different activities, national, European and worldwide, 
especially in the field of gastroenterology. Professor Omaren. Thank you very much, uh, and thank you very much for your pronunciation of my name. It's fantastic, because usually you have difficulties with it, but it's very simple. All you have to look out at the weather, and you say, oh, more rain. <laughs> uh, but, uh, a few uh, conflict of interest, uh, I suppose the one conflict, of course, I'm at that age group that I'd be depending on ULAR to come up with uh, some magic cure for osteoarthritis, and uh, so I'd be... Uh, depending on them for my future health. Uh, I, I am a previous dean of a faculty of health sciences in Trinity College Dublin and a professor of medicine. I've been a previous president uh, of the United European Gastroenterology, which has a lot of similarities as we deal with uh, chronic diseases, uh, such as inflammatory bowel disease that have a lot of overlap with, uh, with arthritis. So it's a real pleasure here to speak to you and to get this invitation. We, in the Biomedical uh, Alliance for Health Research in Europe, represent 27 different pan-European organizations. And I'd like to compliment ULAR being such an active member of our organization that leads to the success. The mission is simple, is to promote excellence in European biomedical research and innovation, with the goal, of course, of improving the health and well-being of all European citizens. I think we as physicians, once we put the patient in the centre, as you saw from that uh, excellent video, that we will get places. So the important for us is to speak with a unified voice on policy issues. It's not only important to have a voice, but that voice has to be listened to and action as a result. We in the Biomedical Alliance and ULAR, our members, all have signed up to a code of conduct on how we conduct our affairs, particularly in relation with the biomedical industry. We have been active in data protection regulation, which I think is very important when it comes to clinical trials, animal research. We, of course, recognize the importance of animals uh, in research, but of course we would like to reduce them, uh, their involvement, but still very important for toxicity studies. Clinical trials is a new initiative that we are doing really driven by EORTEC, which is the Organization for Cancer, for cancer Research. It's their full-time job is clinical trials, and have been hugely successful at that. But the main importance of this new clinical trials initiative is we're putting patients in the center. That patients should be choosing trials rather than we choosing patients for trials based on biomedical data and uh, gene genetic <laughs> profiles. Continuous medical education is a feature and important for anybody in the medical profession to keep up to date. And one of the way we achieve that is by our annual medical conferences that we would like to preserve and uh, strengthen for the future, rather than to see the development of standalone meetings which can be more biased since they're organized by one single company. It is very opportune that we have this uh, meeting today because everything has been formulated for the next framework. And I think we can learn from the previous and benefit from analysis of the previous uh, uh, Horizon 2020. We, in conjunction with FEMS, the Federation of European Academies of Medicines, has, have identified gaps in, uh, in health research in the future. There is an urgent advocacy need for clinical health research in Europe in view of the forthcoming EU framework program for research and innovation. The Biomed Alliance calls for the European institutions to focus to the forthcoming FP9 related discussions. We do think there should be more support for collaborative multidisciplinary translational biomedical research that we should continue to fund those successful networks that have been established by previous frameworks, as it does take more than five to ten years for an idea to get to the marketplace. We would, longer term, like to see a creation of a European Council of Health Research that will support biomedical and clinical research in Europe. We in the Biomedical Alliance represent over 400,000 <coughs> translational clinical scientists. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Omarin.
So I will not forget the name, but it's the rain. It's a very nice uh, combination. So uh, it is a pleasure also to introduce Luminita Hayes. If we think about health at the global level, of course, WHO is a very important uh, organization. And uh, Dr. Haynes has been working in the public health area in her own native country in Romania, especially tackling tobacco control. And for about 10 years, she joined the WHO in Geneva and is in charge of many of the items at the non-communicable diseases area. So we very welcome you here. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Thank you to the organizers for inviting WHO to be part of this important meeting. And I'm sure it will be a very interesting meeting today. I was prepared to address the distinguished professors Bilsma and O. Moraine, um, the honorable members of member of the parliament. I'm, I, I, you will apologize. You will um, excuse me if I if I really don't uh, address all the distinguished members of the panel. You have their names there, and I don't want to make any more mistakes in reading the names. Um, however. I'm going to start uh, similarly with um, um, Professor O. Moraine to explain that my name is Hayes. Um, this doesn't mean I'm coming with a Hayes days. Um, so I will try actually to clarify a little bit the mist around what WHO is, is trying to do to address the musculoskeletal diseases. And Please don't be surprised that um, I'm going to uh, speak a little bit about a few elements that probably friends in this room are not speaking about it very, very um, often. Firstly, on behalf of the WHO, I would like to congratulate ULAR for its 70 years anniversary of supporting the pan-European fight against rheumatic and musculoskeletal diseases, fostering excellence in education and research in the field of rheumatology. Um, I hope that 70 years old doesn't mean too much of the back pain and joints and everything um, that comes with the, this age. We, we see ULAR as a young, very dynamic organization, <laughs> still. <laughs> um, as you know, through the WHO Action Plan for the Prevention and Control of Non-Communicable Diseases that was adopted last year, WHO Europe recognized that musculoskeletal conditions are the greatest cause of disability in the European region, affecting all ages. This is a first, actually, uh, and that's why I'm mentioning it, because un until now, Physical activity was recognized separately in some uh, programmatic documents or obesity as cause of musculoskeletal disease or autoimmune disease with the, um, um, rheumatic arthritis, but not as a whole, as a group like that in this um, action plan. As we know, there are major cause of worklessness and in older ages, loss of independence. The action plan incorporates WHO's Europe Health 2020 policy framework and follows up the UN United Nations high-level meeting on NCDs in 2011, 2014, and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. So you see, it's coming up to the political level, to the strategy level. This is why it's very important to talk about these things as well. So we have this operational level, and I'm sure that everybody in this room will talk about it, but without political will, we cannot do anything in countries. How do we get political will? Through these high-level commitments in UN General Assemblies, in, in, in WHO regional committees, on the uh, World Health Assembly, and so on. Um, the WHO Action Plan has been developed through a consultative process guided by technical experts, and we are pleased to mention ULAR, which, along with the musculoskeletal community, supported the development of the action plan through provision of data and the burden and strategies for their control. So thank you very much. Good musculoskeletal health is a prerequisite for mobility, economic independence, and active, healthy aging. Some of the leading causes of years lived with disability due to musculoskeletal disorders share common risk factors with the main NCDs, which are 
cardiovascular disease, diabetes, chronic respiratory disease, and cancer. They are targeted by the WHO European Action Plan, but not only. Addressing these risk factors, firstly, by achieving increased physical activity, ideal body weight, smoking cessation, moderate use of alcohol, and I know for sure we have in, in, in this room colleagues that are working in these two areas, they sometimes are forgotten. Um, along with injury prevention, remains the predominant entry point benefiting the four main NCDs, as well as other non-communicable conditions of concerning the European region in terms of disease burden and quality of life, such as musculoskeletal conditions. The control of musculoskeletal diseases and prevention of disability depends on availability and timely access to musculoskeletal health systems to enable early intervention and rehabilitation. We have seen the film that is very, very um, uh, touching, and uh, thank you for uh, putting it up. Services need to be person-centered, integrated across the health community, and orientated towards enabling people to self-manage their musculoskeletal conditions and towards reducing the medicalization of common problems. Strong action is indeed required if we are to achieve the overall target of 25% reduction in the non-communicable disease mortality by 2025, as it is in the action plan where musculoskeletal conditions are included. Progress has been made in the European region, however, Many countries are still on track, off track, off track. WHO is working with countries to accelerate the implementation of the action plan and achievement of global targets. And I'm going to talk about two main elements that I'm not sure how much they are going to men be mentioned in the room today. My colleague from WHO, Copenhagen, Dr. Manfred um, will speak a little bit about the musculoskeletal disease elements of the action plan. So I will leave to him to talk about that. Instead, I will speak a little bit about prevention of obesity, which makes us all candidates to musculoskeletal diseases, and physical activity. In the action plan, we don't dream of reducing obesity. It's very difficult at the, mo at the moment. Our target is to halt the increase, at least that. And as regards to halting the increase in obesity, for example, member states have adopted a European Food and Nutrition Action Plan. So it is political commitment. It is from 2015 to 2020. WHO Europe is providing support in monitoring the situation, introducing the most cost-effective measures, and evaluating the impact. The WHO European Childhood Obesity Surveillance Initiative with financial support from the European Commission, is now in its fourth round, data of collection, uh, round of data collection. The third round reported highest rates in the southern European countries. This is remarkable given the association of these countries with a traditional Mediterranean diet. So there is something wrong in there. Recent data actually show that young people are eating far too many foods, high in fats, sugar, and, and salt notably sugary drinks. Most young people who are overweight today will not outgrow obesity. About four in every five adolescents who become obese will continue to have weight problems as adults. And back pain and jo joint pain and, and all, all these um, later problems. In addition, Adolescents routinely report around 12 to 15 percent of total energy intake of free sugars, more than double the 5 percent limit recommended by WHO. Therefore, the attention of member states has recently turned to measures for reducing the demand for foods that are high in fats, sugar, and salt, such as nutrient profiling, the science of classifying foods according to their nutritional quality and tackling digital marketing, which is more and more visible in social media where our children are um, every day present. WHO is strongly supporting its European member states in such efforts with some notable successes, such as in Portugal, the adoption of national legislation on marketing to children, including digital media. In Slovenia, the adoption in national legislation of WHO Europe Nutrient Profile Model the introduction of new rules on digital marketing in the United Kingdom, 
and the introduction in Norway of a government, mon government monitoring framework to rigorously evaluate self-regulatory -re schemes. WHO is also encouraging countries to introduce price policies, i.e. increasing the price of these sugary products. There is an emerging trend in European countries to have a two-tiered tax, such as in United Kingdom and Ireland, with a higher rate applying to products with sugar content aiming to discourage people to consume sugary drinks. The second evaluation of the Hungarian product tax confirmed the greatest impact on people with obesity. So it costs more, they buy less. And they use the money for something else, which is another benefit. In the area of reinforcing health systems to promote healthy diets, WHO Europe builds capacity of countries for effective interventions through training for nutrition and physical activity in the primary health care, which sometimes it's forgotten, showing that primary care is an essential part of the wide team sharing responsibility for addressing obesity. The other goal that I would like, the other target that I would like to talk about is reducing physical inactivity. For this one, our target is to reduce it by 10% by 2025. It has a clear impact on musculoskeletal health. And for this one, WHO continuously calls on all sectors, including health, transport, housing, and education, to engage with this issue and collaborate in effective policies and interventions. It is a matter of all government, be it national or local. If we have children that have uh, physical education in schools or if they have a playground or if there are cycling paths. This is a, a governmental, um, be it local or national, responsibility. The WHO European Member States adopted a physical activity strategy for implementation up to 2025, so they committed for that. So the political will is there. WHO's Move for Health initiative advocates the benefits of physical activity and generates public awareness by highlighting good practices. Also, WHO Europe facilitates the European network for the promotion of health-enhancing physical activity. Its experts produce practical tools, guidelines, case studies, which are being used across the region. It also participates in research activities. As an example, a very recent one, WHO Europe has produced a health economic assessment tool, we call it HEAT, to help countries assess the cost effectiveness of environmental policies to promote walking and cycling. And we are working with countries to uh, conduct these assessments. WHO is also continuously raising public and policymakers' awareness by implementing global campaigns, such as on 11 of October, we had World Obesity Day. It was not an anniversary or celebration. It was not a commemoration either, but it was definitely a day to mark a huge signal that obesity is going to affect our lives if we don't act now. There was also the European Week of Sports initiated by the European Commission enthusiastically joined by WHO Europe. These are important signals and they, they, they increase the awareness of population and policymakers. And we have the World Arthritis Day, which is so much not in the attention of policymakers. And we need to make sure that this becomes so. Ladies and gentlemen, WHO continuously aims to support countries by providing timely reports and guidance, developing practical tools, using our convening power to advance work around the given agenda and monitoring progress in implementation. Muscular health, musculoskeletal health is a part of the commitments of heads of state and governments for fighting against the non-communicable disease global epidemic. We have the evidence and we have the tools. The WHO European Action Plan is part of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Health for all through universal health coverage 
is a top priority of the newly elected WHO's Director General, Dr. Tedros. Such goal can only be achieved by a comprehensive approach involving all sectors of the government, as well as civil society, academia, professional associations, patients fora, and relevant private sector interests. It is important to understand the causes of musculoskeletal conditions through permanent research, permanent research, and novel research, and monitoring, of course, and for governments to invest in prevention and early intervention measures. It is also vital to recognize that government and society have ethical obligations to act. Failure to do so will impact the social and health capital of future generations and increase inequities in Europe and beyond. Wishing you the best of success. We thank you for inviting WHO to be with you today. We look forward to the outcome of the meeting and to better health for all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Hayes. Not a misty story at all. So thank you very much for that. So from global to European, which is very near to our heart, of course, it's a real pleasure that we have Mario Kiliano here because she's a member of the European Parliament, but she started her political career quite early on. I understood that you were not even 20 years old when you had your first political job. You have been a member of the Finnish Parliament, you have been a minister in the Finnish government, and now you are very active in the European Parliament. So, very welcome, and we hope to hear a few words of you about the future of health, research and innovation after Horizon 2020. Thank you. Dear ladies and gentlemen, somebody might even say hyperactive MEP. Uh, I try to info you there's uh, some, some news on supporting how e EP, European Parliament, is supporting health research and innovations and giving the priorities uh, to research and innovation policies and uh, how we look the next uh, research uh, framework, uh, framework program. Uh, the European Parliament actually monitors the implementing measures of Horizon 2020 and research, um, receives all the information needed also from the research working party of the Council. Uh, ITREC committee, the Committee on Industry, Research and Energy, is leading the work with the Horizon 2020 in the Parliament. And actually this summer, ITRE got a report on the assessment of Horizon 2020, implementation of the views, its interim, in, uh, interim evaluation and the framework uh, Program 9 proposal. In this, uh, in this report, there's, uh, there's issues which pointed up. And uh, actually, the very sad thing is that EU invested only two 0.00% of GDP in research and development in 2015, with individual figures for different countries ranging from 0.46% to 3.26%, uh, so not so much. And uh, there's a very huge gap of uh, not doing and not doing cooperation well enough between industry and the universities and the member states and also the scientific establishments uh, so as to facilitate the creation of dedicated structures with universities and scientific centers for the purpose of forging closer links with the production sector. So we need to keep connected better and also how we could share the good ideas, the good innovations, the good practices between member states. There's a lack of links still today. And uh, uh, Parliament welcomed all the initiatives which bring the private and public sectors together to stimulate research and innovation. Uh, we stressed that the need for enhanced EU leadership in prioritizing uh, public research needs and for su uh, sufficient transparency, trace uh, 
uh, ability and fair level of public return on investments of Horizon 2020 in term, terms of uh, affordability, availability and uh, suitability of end products and particularly in some sensitive areas such as health, safeguarding the public interest and equal, equal, equal social impacts. And uh, the big issue in the Parliament nowadays is how we can ensure the autonomy of research. As politicians should participate, but not too much. And uh, also how we can support all the young innovative researchers who urgently want to have some money for the researcher, uh, researchers and uh, need the little boost for their innovative work. And uh, next, I would like to very, very shortly open the possibilities in the European Parliament, uh, how the members of the Parliament can facilitate the research and innovation activities. From the financial perspective, following the entry in the force of the Lisbon Treaty, which entered into force on 1st December 2009, the European Parliament now shares the power to decide on the entire annual budget of the EU with the Council uh, of the European Union, and it has the final say. This gives the EP possibility to try to increase the budget in the field of health research, if there's a will. And what you need to do for change the will or make the will uh, bigger. It's uh, all about knowledge. Inform each other, tell hopes, needs, make us understand that there's real needs, access to medication, access to treatments, problems in daily life. There need to be fair play in all member states, finance for studies, new treatments, new medication, and uh, what is also important, to show us politicians what everything really costs. What it costs if we don't help you. Loss of uh, capability to work, capability to act in normal daily life. What it means when you need to uh, have new, new um, studies. What you have to say change your life. We are only checking the one point of costs, but if we put everything on the same line, it's very huge amount of money. And usually we shouldn't speak about money because it's something more when you get sick. But in the European Parliament, if you can show what is the final ending point with all costs, that wakes up all the politicians in, in every every political group. And what we need to do to get the political will, if we have the enough knowledge and understanding amongst us politicians, then we are reacting. And uh, what is the easiest receipt to get, uh, get people to wake up? It's be active. Talk, give info, send messages, get connected. Find first the supporters of your ideas and then those supporters can find uh, more colleagues to work with these important issues together. And uh, with the financial issues, there's also possibility to organize pilot projects and do um, preparatory actions of the European Parliament. And they are very important tools which are actually not so very much well known or well used amongst, uh, amongst people. And uh, I think we have hearings in the committee level too. We meet agencies, for example, the EMA, European Medi uh, Medicines Agency, and all the information, it's the background, give us the understanding that we need to support the health research and health innovations. And the last point, don't, don't forget 
those working groups which are doing very uh, innovative and active work in the parliament. Inside the parliament, not very many, uh, many of uh, us are saying that, okay, it's, um, uh, it, is, uh, it is work which, is doing, which we do behind the uh, schemes, but it's very effective because that's the uh, thing where we wake up the other colleagues also to get the knowledge, get the understanding. Because when we are connecting with other, uh, having connections with other MEPs, they are asking us to come, those working groups meetings, to understand their issues, those important issues for them. And then we have the connection to ask them also to come and visit uh, those meetings which are important for us. So it's kind of, I'm scratching your back, you're scratching mine, and then we can get connected also with those issues which are maybe not so important for, for other colleagues. But be active. You can't be too active. Even hyperactivity is, is good in, in European Parliament. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much for a very stimulating and uh, even perhaps a little bit promising uh, message. So we'll come back to that. And I hope you will be able in your time scheme to attend most of this day because some of the items you mentioned will be in this day as well. So the last speaker in the opening session will be uh, Dieter Wieck. Dieter Wieck uh, became an, at a very early age a patient with rheumatoid arthritis. Despite that, he has been a teacher for over 40 years in the German uh, society. And we are very happy that over five years he is now a very active member of the patient organization. And he has done different functions, but at this moment he is vice president of EULA on behalf of the patient organizations. Dieter. Yes, thank you very much um, for the introduction. I'd like to, re it's now getting a little more basic, I think. Uh, I'd like to um, outline um, why we patients think that we need research. Um, the first thing is, uh, thing is, people who now uh, benefit from these fantastic new drugs, they see that they've got a new quality of life. When I go to a rheumatology clinic, that's where I go regularly, I see what it means to patients. But still, there are lots of things we do not know. Why one drug works, why another one does not. Um, why one person gets a certain illness and the other one not. So the first point is we need more medical knowledge there. The second point I've got here seems a little contradictory. It is not. There are d diseases where we know very, very little. Last week, I had the opportunity to go to a conference on osteoarthritis. And I remember it's about a few months ago, I did a focus group on um, what patients think, uh, what is the quality of care in their country for osteoarthritis. And uh, it was a disaster uh, because people felt, well, there's not much what they get, what kind of treatment do they get. It's a little, uh, some painkillers, some, uh, let's say, physiotherapy perhaps, but this is not sufficient. We need research over there as well. There are lots of rare diseases where pharma is not interested so much in uh, funding, research. And... The last point here, um, Power sees that there is a huge discrepancy between uh, countries, for example, in Eastern Europe and then Western Europe, if you look at health care, quality of care for people. So, and this also means that they do not have the money to, re to fund research in Eastern countries. So I think another argument is that we need European initiatives uh, that is really that uh, research is funded. I've been working uh, for a patient organization for many, many years. Um, but uh, the situation, I think, the, it, within EULA is unique. 
unique because we've got these three pillars and also these three pillars, that is, the scientists, doctors, health professionals and people with IMDs really work together uh, and on the same level. That's what I feel. Um, don't be distracted because the people with IMDs are on the right at the top. This is not true. This has got graphic uh, reasons. But what has got to do with this topic? In 2010, Euler developed recommendations for the inclusion of patient representatives in scientific projects. And this was really the start then that we said, well, um, patients should be included in the research cycle. That is, they should be included from the beginning of research project. This is what we would like to see. And I can say that I've been involved in many, many projects also within EULA, in with, um, involved in many recommendations, and uh, this is true. But we would like to see that this not only happens uh, within EULA, but also, uh, let's say, if we are invited uh, to take part in other initiatives. <clears throat> I don't want to go into details here. Um, I think you know that. Um, it's, the headline was patience. I must admit, I'm not so very happy about that, using the word patient there, because uh, I think it's people with arthritis, or better to my mind, would be to say citizens are involved in uh, research projects. So from 2010, Euler <coughs> developed um, several seminars, uh, trainings for patient research partners, and you see we had um, a meeting two weeks ago, and you see what has happened. Now we have got a huge group of patient research partners, and uh, we would like to see, to sum it up, that really research is funded on a European level, and also that patients are, or citizens with rheumatic diseases are included in research projects. Thank you very much. <laughs>